The Art of Public Speaking by Dale Carnegie and Joseph Berg Asenwein, Section 44, Appendix D, Speeches for Study and Practice. John Hay, Tribute to McKinley. From his memorial address at a joint session of the Senate and House of Representatives on February 27, 1903. For the third time, the Congress of the United States are assembled to commemorate the life and the death of a president slain by the hand of an assassin. The attention of the future historian will be attracted to the features which reappear with startling sameness in all three of these awful crimes. The uselessness, the utter lack of consequence of the act, the obscurity, the insignificance of the criminal, the blamelessness, so far as in our sphere of existence the best of men may be held blameless, of the victim. Not one of our murdered presidents had an enemy in the world. They were all of such preeminent purity of life that no pretext could be given for the attack of passional crime. They were all men of democratic instincts who could never have offended the most jealous advocates of equity. They were of kindly and generous nature to whom wrong or injustice was impossible of moderate fortune whose slender means nobody could envy they were men of austere virtue of tender heart of eminent abilities which they had devoted with single minds to the good of the republic if ever men walked before god and man without blame it was these three rulers of our people the only temptation to attack their lives offered was their gentle radiance. To eyes hating the light, that was offense enough. The stupid uselessness of such an infamy affronts the common sense of the world. One can conceive how the death of a dictator may change the political conditions of an empire, how the extinction of a narrowing line of kings may bring in an alien dynasty, but in a well-ordered republic like ours the ruler may fall but the state feels no tremor our beloved and revered leader is gone but the natural process of our laws provides us a successor identical in purpose and ideals nourished by the same teachings inspired by the same principles pledged by tender affection as well as by high loyalty to carry to completion the immense task committed to his hands and to smite with iron severity every manifestation of that hideous crime which his mild predecessor with his dying breath forgave the sayings of celestial wisdom have no date the words that reach us over two thousand years out of the darkest hour of gloom the world has ever known are true to life today they know not what they do. The blow struck at our dear friend and ruler was as deadly as blind hate could make it, but the blow struck at anarchy was deadlier still. How many countries can join with us in the community of a kindred sorrow? I will not speak of those distant regions where assassination enters into the daily life of government but among the nations bound to us by the ties of familiar intercourse who can forget that wise and mild autocrat who had earned the proud title of the liberator that enlightened and magnanimous citizen whom france still mourns that brave and chivalrous king of italy who only lived for his people and saddest of all that lovely and sorrowing empress whose harmless life could hardly have excited the animosity of a demon against that devilish spirit nothing avails neither virtue nor patriotism nor age nor youth nor conscience nor pity we cannot even say that education is a sufficient safeguard against this baleful evil for most of the wretches whose crimes have so shocked humanity in recent years were men not unlettered 
who have gone from the common schools through murder to the scaffold. The life of William McKinsey was, from his birth to his death, typically American. There is no environment, I should say, anywhere else in the world which could produce just such a character. He was born into that way of life which elsewhere is called the middle class, but which in this country is so nearly universal as to make of other classes an almost negligible quantity. He was neither rich nor poor, neither proud nor humble. He knew no hunger he was not sure of satisfying, no luxury which could enervate mind or body. His parents were sober, God-fearing people, intelligent and upright, without pretension and without humility. He grew up in the company of boys like himself, wholesome, honest, self-respecting. They looked down on nobody. They never felt it possible they could be looked down upon. Their houses were the homes of probity, piety, patriotism. They learned in the admirable school readers of fifty years ago the lessons of heroic and splendid life which have come down from the past. They read in their weekly newspapers the story of the world's progress, in which they were eager to take part, and of the sins and wrongs of civilization with which they burned to do battle. It was a serious and thoughtful time. The boys of that day felt dimly, but deeply, that days of sharp struggle and high achievement were before them. They looked at life with the wondering yet resolute eyes of a young esquire in his vigil of arms. They felt a time was coming when to them should be addressed the stern admonition of the apostle, Quit you like men, be strong. The men who are living today and were young in 1860 will never forget the glory and glamour that filled the earth and the sky when the long twilight of doubt and uncertainty was ending and the time for action had come. A speech by Abraham Lincoln was an event not only of high moral significance but of far-reaching importance. The drilling of a militia company by Ellsworth attracted national attention. The fluttering of the flag in the clear sky drew tears from the eyes of young men. Patriotism, which had been a rhetorical expression, became a passionate emotion in which instinct, logic, and feeling were fused. The country was worth saving. It could be saved only by fire. No sacrifice was too great. The young men of the country were ready for the sacrifice. Come weal, come woe, they were ready. At 17 years of age, William McKinley heard the summons of his country. He was the sort of youth to whom a military life in ordinary times would possess no attractions. His nature was far different from that of the ordinary soldier. He had other dreams of life, its prizes and pleasures, than that of marches and battles. But to his mind there was no choice or question. The banner floating in the morning breeze was the beckoning gesture of his country. The thrilling note of the trumpet called him, him and none other, into the ranks. His portrait in his first uniform is familiar to you all. The short, stocky figure, the quiet, thoughtful face, the deep, dark eyes. It is the face of a lad who could not stay at home when he thought he was needed in the field. He was of the stuff of which good soldiers are made. Had he been ten years older, he would have entered at the head of a company and come out at the head of a division. But he did what he could. He enlisted as a private. He learned to obey. His serious, sensible ways, his prompt, alert efficiency soon attracted the attention of his superiors. He was so faithful in little things that they gave him more and more to do. He was untiring in camp and on the march, swift, cool and fearless in fight he left the army with field rank when the war ended breveted by president lincoln for gallantry in battle 
in coming years when men seek to draw the moral of our great civil war nothing will seem to them so admirable in all the history of our two magnificent armies as the way in which the war came to a close when the confederate army saw the time had come they acknowledged the pitiless logic of facts and ceased fighting when the army of the union saw it was no longer needed without a murmur or question making no terms asking no return in the flush of victory and fullness of might it laid down its arms and melted back into the mass of peaceful citizens there is no event since the nation was born which has so proved its solid capacity for self-government both sections share equally in that crown of glory they had held a debate of incomparable importance and had fought it out with equal energy a conclusion had been reached and it is to the everlasting honor of both sides that they each knew when the war was over and the hour of a lasting peace had struck we may admire the desperate daring of others who prefer annihilation to compromise but the palm of common sense and i will say of enlightened patriotism belongs to the men like grant and lee who knew when they had fought enough for honor and for country so it came naturally about that in eighteen seventy six the beginning of the second century of the republic he began by an election to congress his political career thereafter for fourteen years this chamber was his home i use the word advisedly nowhere in the world was he so in harmony with his environment as here nowhere else did his mind work with such full consciousness of its powers the air of debate was native to him here he drank delight of battle with his peers in after days when he drove by this stately pile or when on rare occasions his duty called him here he greeted his old haunts with the affectionate zest of a child of the house during all the last ten years of his life filled as they were with activity and glory he never ceased to be homesick for this hall when he came to the presidency there was not a day when his congressional service was not of use to him probably no other president has been in such full and cordial communion with congress if we may accept lincoln alone mckinley knew the legislative body thoroughly its composition its methods its habit of thought he had the profoundest respect for its authority and an inflexible belief in the ultimate rectitude of its purposes our history shows how surely an executive court's disaster and ruin by assuming an attitude of hostility or distrust to the legislature and on the other hand mckinley's frank and sincere trust and confidence in congress were repaid by prompt and loyal support and cooperation during his entire term of office this mutual trust and regard so essential to the public welfare was never shadowed by a single cloud when he came to the presidency he confronted a situation of the utmost difficulty which might well have appalled a man of less serene and tranquil self-confidence there had been a state of profound commercial and industrial depression from which his friends had said his election would relieve the country our relations with the outside world left much to be desired the feeling between the northern and southern sections of the union was lacking in the cordiality which was necessary to the welfare of both hawaii had asked for annexation and had been rejected by the preceding administration there was a state of things in the caribbean which could not permanently endure our neighbor's house was on fire and there were grave doubts as to our rights and duties in the premises a man either weak or rash either irresolute or headstrong might have brought ruin on himself and incalculable harm to the country the least desirable form of glory to a man of his habitual mood and temper that of successful war 
was nevertheless conferred upon him by uncontrollable events. He felt it must come. He deplored its necessity. He strained, almost a breaking, his relations with his friends in order first to prevent and then to postpone it to the latest possible moment. But when the die was cast, he labored with the utmost energy and ardor, and with an intelligence in military matters which showed how much of the soldier still survived in the mature statesman to push forward the war to a decisive close. War was an anguish to him. He wanted it short and conclusive. His merciful zeal communicated itself to his subordinates, and the war, so long dreaded, whose consequences were so momentous, ended in a hundred days. Mr. McKinley was re-elected by an overwhelming majority. There had been little doubt of the result among well-informed people, but when it was known, a profound feeling of relief and renewal of trust were evident among the leaders of capital and industry, not only in this country, but everywhere. They felt that the immediate future was secure, and that trade and commerce might safely push forward in every field of effort and enterprise. He felt that the harvest time was come to garner in the fruits of so much planting and culture, and he was determined that nothing he might do or say should be liable to the reproach of a personal interest. Let us say frankly he was a party man. He believed the policies advocated by him and his friends counted for much in the country's progress and prosperity. He hoped in his second term to accomplish substantial results in the development and affirmation of those policies. I spent a day with him shortly before he started on his fateful journey to Buffalo. Never had I seen him higher in hope and patriotic confidence. He was gratified to the heart that we had arranged a treaty which gave us a free hand in the isthmus. In fancy, he saw the canal already built and the argosies of the world passing through it in peace and amity. He saw in the immense evolution of American trade the fulfillment of all his dreams, the reward of all his labors. He was, I need not say, an ardent protectionist, never more sincere and devoted than during those last days of his life. He regarded reciprocity as the bulwark of protection, not a breach, but a fulfillment of the law. The treaties which for four years had been preparing under his personal supervision, he regarded as ancillary to the general scheme. He was opposed to any revolutionary plan of change in the existing legislation. He was careful to point out that everything he had done was in faithful compliance with the law itself. In that mood of high hope, of generous expectation, he went to Buffalo, and there, on the threshold of eternity, he delivered that memorable speech, worthy for its loftiness of tone, its blameless morality, its breadth of view, to be regarded as his testament to the nation. Through all his pride of country and his joy of its success runs the note of solemn warning, as in Kipling's noble hymn, Lest We Forget. The next day sped the bolt of doom, and for a week after, in an agony of dread, broken by elusive glimpses of hope that our prayers might be answered, the nation waited for the end. Nothing in the glorious life we saw gradually waning was more admirable and exemplary than its close. The gentle humanity of his words when he saw his assailant in danger of summary vengeance. Do not let them hurt him. His chivalrous care that the news should be broken gently to his wife. The fine courtesy with which he apologized for the damage which his death would bring to the great exhibition. And the heroic resignation of his final words. It is God's way, his will not ours, be done.
were all the instinctive expressions of a nature so lofty and so pure that pride in its nobility at once softened and enhanced the nation's sense of loss. The Republic grieved over such a son, but is proud forever of having produced him. After all, in spite of its tragic ending, his life was extraordinarily happy. He had all his days troops of friends, the cheer of fame and fruitful labor, and he became at last, on fortune's crowning slope, the pillar of a people's hope, the center of a world's desire. End of section 44. Recording by Paul Adams.